This episode of the Oh No 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 podcast is sponsored by Dynamic Industrial Services, the Rope Access Specialists. The roof of the south stand at Starch Park is some 19 metres above the pitch, the same height as 11 Aidan Connollys. But as we all know, there's only one Aidan Connolly, and so you'd be much better off with Dynamic Industrial Services. DIS specialise in working at height, offering a range of services including maintenance, inspection and repair. To find out more, visit dynamicindustrialservices.co.uk Welcome back to the Oh No 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 podcast and it's quite fitting that it's Easter because rather than talk about yesterday's game I think we'd all prefer to disappear into a tomb for three days and three nights. But there are four of us here this morning to roll away the stone and see if we can't resurrect some optimism out of Dundee United 2, Wraith Rovers and them. Uh, my name is Duncan Cameron and I am joined for this episode by uh, Robbie Weir. First of all, how are you Robbie? Yeah, not bad, fitting that the clocks went forward and we lost an hour because we, we lost quite a wee bit more than an hour yesterday, but, you know, all that to mull over today. I forgot about that, actually. The clocks have gone forward. Surely that means we're back. This is this is Rover's time. We're uh, a, a scoosh for the run-in now. Um, we've also got Leslie Maybon. How are you, Les? It may be Easter, but I could have done a lot better than seeing Tony Watt resurrect the ghost of Brian Prunty yesterday. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I have to talk about Tony Watt a lot, I think, in this. Um, and uh, John Creer is also here. How are you, John? I'm fine, uh, all things considered, yep. Excellent. Good. I'm glad to hear it. So I think we're going to have to start by addressing the elephant in the room on this one. Um, Robbie, I'll come to you first of all. <laughs> Did Ian Murray get it wrong yesterday? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I know that you looked at the two starting lineups, and I think for me, a lot of the focus went to United's lineup and the fact that they were missing Gallagher, they were missing Holt, they had Miller Thompson that right back, McMahon was back, but it was half fit, and that you've got uh, McClelland in there as well. Um, for Rovers, the the main bit that jumped out was just that we didn't have that holding midfielder in there and everyone straight away saying, well, wow, that's a bit harsh on Ross Matthews, Kyle Turner's, if he's playing sitting midfielder, which we've seen a few times before and it's maybe not worked for the best. Um, I don't think it's his natural position. We really need a big game out of Kyle Turner. And uh, yeah, it just it came to pass that I, I said in our group chat before, um, if you remember back in the COVID season, uh, there was huge Charlie Cowie vibes about it, i.e. The, the 16-year-old that got taken out of school and chucked on a bus to play for Queen of the South out of Dumfries uh, during the COVID season, and we didn't even put a huge shot, uh, didn't even put a single shot on target against them that day. Um, we did get shots on target yesterday, but yeah, we did not um, control that game in a way that you would hope, and um, we started it really, really well. For the first five minutes, you're thinking, oof. Ian Murray's had an absolute masterclass here. We're uh, in control of the game. We're creating chances. We've got the ball up there end of the pitch. And then it all unfurled quite quickly. Um, and both through, a bit through their design and also a bit through our own own misfortune and um, our own choices as well, I would say. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll obviously we'll, we'll talk about the goal in, in more detail, but <clears throat> it is a little bit of a sliding doors moment almost when they score with that first attack you know if I think if we score in that first five minutes even leaving all the, the tactical and the selection stuff that we're going to talk a lot more about be quite critical about it I'm honest um, if we score in that first five minutes it's a totally different game totally different um, we get the atmosphere we want both sides exactly different atmosphere the game might then start to develop in the kind of one where you would want 
or, or be happy with um, a Kyle Turner as your, your biggest line midfielder. But as soon as that first goal goes in, for them, it's, it's a totally different thing. And I just think it's a little bit... <sighs> I'm going to use this word more than once today. I think it's a little bit naive. The way that that setup, that midfield setup in particular, I think you could get away with if you're playing at home to like a League Two side that's down on their luck, something like that. Um, a game where you expect to really kind of dominate the ball, you can almost afford the the luxury of, I mean, a really good player like Kyle Turner. This is a, actually nothing I'm going to say is a, a criticism of Kyle Turner at all. But we were never going to dominate the ball in that midfield. Even mm. in the first game at Tannadice, actually, when they didn't have Ross Doherty, you've got a better shot at it. But yesterday, we were always going to be relying on a battle in the midfield. And Kyle Turner, for all his, his qualities, is not that player. But we've said it a couple of weeks ago um, when we were at Hamden, we played Queen's Park. Like, Kyle Turner's spent too much of this game facing the wrong way in the first half. And I thought that was a huge part of that. Um, Certainly the first half yesterday as well. Um, Leslie, for you, biggest kind of problems with that starting lineup and then the way it then played out? There's not much I can really disagree with there. I mean, I think that the thing that surprised me about Kyle Turner starting where he did was it didn't really work against Queen's Park either. I mean, okay, you know, he did better later on in the game, and like like Blair was saying last time, it was Regan Henry esque. But that was after Dom Thomas had come off, after Killian Sheridan had come off, and after the two kids off. So you know, we've been completely overrun by Queen's Park with Kyle Turner and Sam Stanton in there, and it's bonkers to to think that that would have worked against. Uh, Dundee United in, in, in hindsight. I mean, I know we'll, we'll come on and talk about the, the goals and things as well later, but the I've, I've done some, some numbers and some number crunching before I came on. So we've now started 14 of 30 games with Scott Brown in defence. In 18 of 30 league games, Scott Brown has at some point played in defence. And you know, he's not terrible, he's not chucking goals in, but what you're doing is you're taking a very good option out of our midfield. And, you know, we saw from the last game against Dundee United how valuable Scott Brown can be in midfield. We saw in the New Year game at uh, Dunfermline when Scott Brown can get forward how good he can be. So, you know, you're, you're then taking another option out there. So I think that, that was the biggest thing for me was I don't... And again, I agree, Kyle Turner's a great player and he's a, he's a very, very classy player. But he's not what we needed in that position. And it very quickly became apparent that that was just ceding all sort of control that we had in the in the midfield. Yeah, I think the thing with that for me is that you're not short of other options. You know, this is a lot of the times we've had question marks over like Ian Murray's selections. It's been a little bit like you've picked the wrong square peg to play in a round hole. You know, but you, you had to do that to some degree. But yesterday, I don't like that. I mean, that basically, other than uh, Lee Ashcroft, an entirely fit squad, everybody took part in full training during the week. So I think to take from that, presumably, everybody was available. Um, I think that's where it starts to, really where the, the, the criticism, I think, starts to become quite valid. Uh, John, how would you, or what would you have done differently in terms of, maybe addressing some of these issues that we're talking about in that starting lineup. Well, my my initial thought was I felt really sorry that um, Ross Matthews had been dropped. Um, I think Ross Matthews, since he came back into the team, has been very good. Um, I, th- I don't think it's any uh, surprise that we had three clean sheets in a row with Ross Matthews in the team. Um, the problem for me yesterday was that we had no ball winner in the midfield. So we, we got no foothold in the game. Um, and because we got no foothold in the game, there was not a chance for um, for Sam Stanton and Lewis Vaughan to do what they are able to do. Because we had no winning of the ball and we had no possession of the ball then. And that that was my problem yesterday. So I think 
much as we've all discussed, Kyle Turner does a, a very good job and he's a, a good footballer. He he showed what how good he could be at Parrick Thistle that night at Firhill. Um but we just didn't win possession enough. And that's where we, we lost the game for me. So, and that's that's not his job. I mean it was yesterday, but that's not that's not what he's you know, if you if you ask Kyle Turner where he wants to play yesterday, he wants to I'm guessing play where Louis Vaughan started. And if you ask Louis Vaughan, he wants to play where Louis Vaughan started. And if you ask Sam Stanton, he probably also wants to play where Louis Vaughan started. You know, we've gone into a huge game, whereas I don't think we had any right to expect that we would dominate that midfield by default and effectively played three number 10s, which is bold, uh, to say the least. And um, this... Uh, listen, I'm not, I'm not for a second saying that anybody who has ever taken part in this podcast has any kind of footballing knowledge uh, to come close to anything like what Ian Murray has. However, when we went through lineups on um, Wednesday night ahead of this game, I think we all had Watson in the defence and we all had at least one of Scott Brown, Ross Matthews, Sean Byrne in the kind of base in the midfield to try and win the ball. Do you think, Robbie, that Ian Murray's maybe guilty of overthinking it in terms of reaching the, the line-up that he did? I don't know. Really hard to say. Um, I think, again, look, it's it's a classic thing to say, easy with hindsight, but at the same time, it's one of these ones where you would expect it, but I'm sure that he's had a strategy and he's heard information about what's happening with the United squad and thinks, oh, this might be a real opportunity to go for the jugular, which might well be why he's decided to to go for the selection that he has. But again, it's you look at players like Sam Stanton, and I think Sam's a brilliant player. Um, yesterday I had a quiet game, but I don't think that was through any fault of his own. I think that was just because of the lack of support that we could get to him and getting the ball into his feet. Um, so, yeah, just... Um, I think we just put ourselves into that position naturally. And it seems strange as well that Watson, he came off the bench and he added a lot of, um, sort of came off the bench for you and Murray early on, just not starting those two together. Just seems, again, if he can play the, the majority of the game, then you don't know if he's nursed an injury. Does that have an impact in terms of his um, sort of recovery going into next week what will happen with that whether he's maybe not been fully fit and we did have a full squad to choose from but maybe we were trying to keep him fresh so yeah it's very it's very tough to tell so yeah yeah I mean prior to um, you and Murray's injury I think the slightly one of the frustrating things for me is that you can kind of fix both of your problems with one change one fix because if you bring Keith Watson and you and Murray in as your defence, either in your starting lineup or actually even after watching 15 minutes of that game, to be brutally honest. If you bring uh, say Keith Watson and you and Murray in as your defenders, it lets you step Scott Brown out into the midfield. And then you see that like the pattern of after the first five minutes, where the Rovers looked really good and had some some decent chances, and um, you know, once that goal went in, you could see very, very clearly what Dundee United's strategy was, and it was the one that made the most sense, which is that they're in the front line, they're picking on Scott Brown, which makes sense. And uh, again, you see it in the first goal, Molt's movement and kind of physicality is probably the key to that. And he's just got the better of Scott Brown. Tony Watt's kind of the same. So they're, they're getting change out of the back line in that sense. But then Tony Watt is also very deliberately dropping back into the midfield and he's picking up Kyle Turn in a kind of one-on-one battle, which again, there's only going to be one winner there. And that's not a criticism of Kyle Turner. That's not his, that's not his game. And you mean, Kyle Turner tried like a bear in that first half. He, was, he wasn't giving Tony Watt a minute's piece, but just in terms of that as a one-on-one battle, and that thing again is, is the frustrating thing because it it was a game where quite naturally I think both front lines are comparatively better than both defences, if that makes sense. You know, United are very, very strong going forward. Um and yesterday, 
quite weak at the back. You know, it's um, Scott McMahon quite kind of publicly ahead of the game wasn't fully fit. Um, Sam McClellan was coming in for his debut. Ross Graham is their third choice centre half and they're playing a teenage winger at right back. So I think I said that, I don't think I'm saying anything controversial by saying I think both attacks are better than both defences. So taking that as red, the midfield then kind of becomes the key battle. And that I think was the one that, that we lost. Because as you say, Robbie, we couldn't get the ball into the feet of Sam Stanton or Louis Vaughan because we weren't getting the ball or, you know, in positions to pass it to. We were having to launch the ball out of the defence to try and get it further up the park. And it, you just you put yourself on the back foot, and it just that was the that was the whole pattern of the game. And the only way to try and counteract that is to turn the ball over in the middle of the park. And with the greatest ball in the world, we didn't have kind of tacklers in there. I and think I think you even put yourself into that position as well. Um, now, far be it from me to to talk about football in terms of any like actual knowledge um, from a playing perspective. But I think it turns it into a game of percentages. I think it's always going to be, firstly, you need Rudden to be winning the flick-ons. Um, and it's not always guaranteed to do that. And I know that people will maybe talk about like the, the sort of target man role and the ability to do that. Um, and I don't think that suits either him. Um, I think Hamilton's really good at it, but I don't think it's Hamilton's main point in this game. Um, but then you're then looking at the extra factor of who's getting the knock-on. And a lot of the times, because it, the ball's going up and it comes, gets knocked on, and if you are getting the against a top team in the league, um, it's always going to be tricky to get players up the park on the back of the knock-ons. So yeah, just then you get the pos- possession coming right back at you, and they're building it up, and we don't have a open midfielder in there. I think it's it's very easy to look at it, um, and it's probably very frustrating from Ian Murray's perspective as well. Um, because you don't want to make a change too early. You make a change too early, you probably slaughter someone's confidence. Uh, if you take off Kyle Turner, he's probably sitting there saying, well, I've not done anything wrong. You asked me to do this role, so why am I getting taken off? So, yeah, um, I think it's it's very easy to, to sort of sit here and play football manager with it, but then the reality is that you get one chance at doing it, and then we all look at everything in hindsight and micro micromanage it. But, again, that's that's the nature of the beast. Yeah, it is. And listen, this is we're always going to do this with the benefit of hindsight. Mm-hmm. But I do also think that we made a lot of these points before the game and, and when the settling was all right. I think there were. Um, and again, with the caveat that, as I say, a goal in the first five minutes changes things. But I, don't, I think even if you want to go and try and do something a little bit different, Blair, a few weeks back, kind of wondered out loud what it would be like to see uh, Jack Hamilton and Zach Rudden together. And we were talking about that in the car on the way up. And it's like, well, it's a big thing because it, it doesn't give you an awful lot of room to change it if, you know, going into the last half hour or whatever. But again, I mean, if you want to do something unexpected, you know, is, is yesterday, yesterday a better option for something like that, given the defence? I mean, Leslie, before we, we kind of get into the maybe some of the, the kind of incidents. Um, anything else from you on just the general, kind of the setup and, and how that dictated the pattern of the game? Well, I think, like, like we said, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to this. The fact that Dundee United scored so early, I think just, we, we know that when they score early, they generally win games. So, so Michael Watson shared a stat in our group chat about not only the fact, that I think Dundee United have not dropped any points from games where they've been leading, more than that, they've also conceded virtually no goals. So they're bloody excellent when they do get in front, at just uh, just coasting through through games. And you know, it was it was a, a an early goal for them. Kind of effectively did, like you say, throw everything out the window. Um, that so yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we we did we did actually get to see. I was thinking back. We did very briefly get to see Hamilton and Rudden playing together against Inverness. We got about five minutes out of them before Hamilton took a knock and had to go off. I mean, the other thing I would just kind of pick up on as well, just going back to what Robbie said, it may be that Watson wasn't 100%, because the logical thing would be that if he is fully fit, you want two uh, bona fide centre-backs starting at centre-back position. I mean, he was he was imperious when he came on, um, for most of most for the most part. 
so it may be that he wasn't fully fit, and that's why we had we had Scott Brown dropping in. But it was, I mean, you know, I think the point as well that it reminds me. You know, I use this analogy too much. It reminds me of when I used to use uh, Newcastle United on Pro Evo Six, and they had phenomenal firepower. You had like Obafemi Martins, you had Michael Owen, you had uh, Nobby Solano. But the problem I always had was I would try and get them all on the pitch at once in a V formation. And it just doesn't work because even when you've got, you're taking the human brain out of the equation and you're using them as, as, as computer characters, you're, you're trying to get too many players who are all doing the same thing. And, and, and I, do, I do feel that we had that yesterday with, with Turner and with Stanton and with Vaughan. You had a lot of players who were all very comfortable being in the same position. And it, it, it made me think a little bit as well. We've had a couple of games like that before where you do kind of wonder if Murray in the back of his mind has thought, right, here's a chance, let's go and batter them. You know, let's get all the forwards on and let's go and batter them without actually thinking, you know, we need to control and win the game first. You know, we did that to an extent against Ayr and against our growth and thought, right, turn the taps on and banjo them rather than actually trying to have the control and winning first. But as I say, I don't know. I'm, you know, the fact that my, my um, football managerial peak came in the mid 2000s with a PS2 game tends to suggest I am not the right person to be advising Ian Murray on tactics. I think it's a fair point, though. I mean, we, we talked about it in kind of starker, I don't know, evidence almost, in some of the games where he'd kind of gone all out in the last 10 minutes. And, and I remember saying, like, you really need to leave a Sean Byrne or a Scott Brown in there just so that you can at least get the ball back. Because otherwise all that happens is your six forwards are just standing watching the other team run around in your half. And it wasn't as, as drastic as that yesterday because... Like Kyle Turner was actually really quite disciplined. You know, he stuck to the task that he was given, but that doesn't change the fact that skill set wise, that's that's not his job. It's not. Um, he's never going to be able to give you what a Ross Matthews would just without even having to really think about it. Um, and it's, I think that's that's the frustrating thing. Um, looking at that is the. Like, I mean, I said yesterday morning, I was really confident going into the game, not confident that we would win necessarily because football is football and anything can happen and you know, Dundee United are a really good side and there's no getting away from that at all. But I was kind of confident that we were in a good place with it and like, you know, we're not missing players and everybody seems to know their jobs and as I say, the frustrating thing is actually then to come away feeling like it was a little bit self-inflicted. Like, I, I don't think we gave ourselves the best chance of getting the best result. And um, it is a, it's a, it's, I don't think it's as, as dramatic, but it's a little bit reminiscent of uh, John McGlynn like, going a bit aye. mad and just dropping <laughs> Dave McGurn. Stephen and, Simmons, uh, that left wing. Aye. It's like, you it's didn't, not, it's just not that down. predatory. Just, it's not. I it's think there was more leeway in the game, and there was. Probably a bit more expectation that I know Dundee United are in a bit of poor form, but at the same time there was a bit of expectation that like they were there to be got at. Uh, but I, I think that I wouldn't quite put it into the 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 same category as you say. Like um, I know that you've obviously said it's not quite Defcon Defcon Five, is it? But still, it was a bit up there. It was a bit up there. Yeah, and um, I think the other thing, and, and we'll we'll talk about it as we go through the the instance. I think the other. Kind of big fact, I'm not, not necessarily a big factor in the game, but a notable um, character in yesterday's game, shall we say, was uh, the referee. Uh, Nick Walsh will have quieter afternoons, I think, is probably a fair comment. Um, now, I want to say for, for my part in this, I'm, I don't think he's a deciding factor. That's what I was trying to kind of caveat there. I think the distance between the two teams was probably great enough that I actually don't think it really mattered. But there are incidents involving the referee all the way through, so um, it would be kind of disingenuous not to talk about them. And um, for the very first one, John, do you think the Rovers should have had a penalty in the first five minutes? Well, at the time, obviously, we're away at the far end, and... Uh... You don't really see it. So it was only last night when I saw the the um the the highlights that you saw it. Um 
Now, I think there's a fundamental problem with referees in Scotland at the moment. And I, I said on our group chat last night that when the, the refereeing in the Premier League, they've got the safety blanket of VAR behind them. Now, that must have a mindset for a guy when he goes on a pitch. He must go on and you think, well, how do I referee it today? You know, I'm not going to have that, that thing. But it was certainly, um, and it was quite interesting, it was Louis Moe that was pulling Sam Stanton's shirt as he tried to get near the ball. Now, it is a penalty. It is a penalty. Are we going to grumble that changed the game? Possibly. But who knows? Who knows? In a Premier League game, you would have thought that would have been given. Um, so we had that, and then we had Louis Maltz's uh, penalty where I think he, he should get the best actress of the weekend for that one. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm kind of the same as you. You know, I'm, I'm a humanitarian, and I think some referees approach human sometimes, and I don't think they're, uh, I don't think they're being given the best chance of being able to just referee games the way they want to. Um, it can't be easy refereeing with a guy in your ear one week and then the next week you're not. Uh, would you really want? Way. Would you really want that by a guy that's dishing out twelve yellow cards in that game? Because I think both sets of fans can look at that game and say there was no danger that there was. 12 yellow cards, one for the manager and 11 across both sides. Both, uh, that's, both that's, sets I, of fans will look at that referee and say, that guy is just a fanny. Like, I'm sure that'll be the case. Um, they'll have instances that they'll probably feel aggrieved about, even though that they won, that they would point to if they'd lost. Um, and I think the, I know that his head's not going to be back in August, but uh, naturally when you look at the referee and appointments and you see, oh, it's Nick Walsh, what referees has he gave, uh, refereed for us? And we had the, the four-all draw where Hamilton Ackes a few seasons back. We had the, the, the Motherwell game in the Scottish Cup where I can't recall any incident. In fact, the only incident I can really recall was them getting a bit upset that Sam Stanton bundled in a header over the line. Um, in the first half and complaining it wasn't for the goalkeeper. But the main thing that stood out was when he sent off Liam Dick at um, Easter Road for a high boot. <laughs> and you're joking in the group chat saying, ah, no high boots today, lads. And then, funnily enough, for a high boot, you just see a yellow card. And no, no two instances are going to be the same. And I don't think that heads heads back in August saying, oh, I remember when I refereed Rafe Rovers, I better make it even. But at the same time... Naturally, as football fans, you're always going to be that wee bit aggrieved. But again, there is that human aspect. And as John says, it's a bit of a lost with our. Maybe it's the case, but you've just got yeah, to I work think, with what um, you've got. I think that, that instant, that first five minutes. I think, John, I think you're right. I think in a VAR game, that's given. When you look at the reverse angle, um, you know, it's it's Molt is Molt is a good kind of two or three yards away from Sam Stanton and is still holding on to his jersey. It's a very obvious one that he's he's pulling Stanton back. But in nine out of ten games without uh, the, the video referee, I don't think it is given. And that's like I mean, I had no idea at the time. It was only as you say when you highlight it, when you saw it in the highlights afterwards. Um, but that. I, and I, I mean, I'd say over the piece. Actually, when you look at the individual incidents, you can highlight ones where you're like, oh, I think the referee could have done us a better turn there or there. And you see the big one is the penalty, which we'll talk about. But I didn't come up, I didn't walk out of the game at the end thinking the referee's done us there. Um, really. Um, and I mean, the other thing that kind of first five minutes, the Rovers did have probably three, or well, maybe two half chances and a big chance. In that first five minutes, it really was a very decent kind of opening period. Um, Leslie, are we just not going to move out the first five minutes of this game? <laughs> we're just going to stay there. To be honest, no. I, I, again, we're going to have like, to talk about Tony Watt at some point in that first goal. Yeah. Um, right, Leslie. I'm going to I'm going to throw you the poison chalice then. Um, I talk us through that first goal then, please, and uh, your thoughts on how it's maybe so, how it could have been prevented. John's just I, abandoned us. Yeah, <laughs> John has just uh, stormed off. He, the thing that, for those of you who are not watching, John has just got up, his, got out his seat and left. And this means one of two things: it either means he's he's going to get himself a cup of tea, 
or it means he's away to get something and he's going to come back and show us something really cool. So fingers crossed it's the latter of those two <laughs> things. And he's going to cheer us up after we've talked about the goal. But um, on, the, on the, the, the Wraith TV comms, Jim Clark described it as being like a Wimbledon 1980s goal. Big kick out from the goalkeeper, on the moat, on the walk, bang, into the net. And this is the thing about both Louis Moat and Tony Watt. Um, they are weapons-grade bellends, but they are exceptionally good footballers with a phenomenal level of game intelligence and a very high performance ceiling. When they fancy it and when they're up for it, this is the kind of thing they can do. And again, I don't mean that as any disrespect to, to our players, but you know that's the kind of things that Dundee United have in their locker. And seeing those, those two combine for that, it was a, a fabulous finish, to be fair. It was a great finish from Tony Watt. Um, you can't fault Dubrovsky or nothing. I don't think he had any chance for that. Defensively, yes, I think we could have done a lot better. I do not want to, you know, I think you and Murray might, might feel they could have done better. Scott Brown as well. They don't want to hang him out to dry, but it's not the first time this season we've seen a goal. And in the group chat, we've all said, you know, if that was Keith Watson, that would have been won and cleared. So, yeah, I think defensively, we could have done better. But to an extent, you do just have to hold your hands up and say, fair play. You know, that's the kind of quality that somebody like Tony Watt brings. I mean, I, I don't know I don't know if you guys remember, there was some story going around, like, he might have scored against some big Spanish team at some point in the past. I don't know if, I don't think it's ever been mentioned. It's not very well known, but... Yeah, I think he's his own worst enemy, Tony Watt. Um, quite cool. Because when he's, when he, he seems to kind of thrive on uh, grievance. So it was a, a topic we talked about in the, the pre- pre-match. He's maybe the poster boy for that. Um, if you can kind of keep him quiet and just ignore him, he, he disappears. But when he fancies it, technical ability-wise, um, I don't know if there's many, possibly any other strikers in the division who are able to finish that in the way that he does. Um, yeah, I don't actually think, for my part, I don't think Ewan Murray does an awful lot wrong. Once that ball comes across him, he gets really tight to Tony Watt. And it's almost like, well, you know, if you're going to score this, you're really going to have to, you know, take it on the chest and then ping it in first time on the left foot volley. And that's then he does that. And you think, bugger. <laughs> you know, I really I was hoping you weren't going to be able to do that. Not many others would. Um, so I haven't seen it. I think you've got to win that first ball. And, and it's, and listen, it's easy to see from here uh, 24 hours later. But I think yeah, a big meat and potatoes centre half gives Louis Moult a, a tougher time almost. Um, and it's but it's Moult's quality. He gets across and by the time the ball gets to him, he's almost removed Scott Brown from the equation just by, by the way he's managed to shape his body. And it's a really nice little kind of cushioned header. Um, and it's, it was, it's just a real sucker punch. I thought it was a really good finish. To be honest, I'll, I'll probably say something quite controversial here. I actually like Tony Watt. I think that... Um, I know that he's got this whole stick about him, the, the grievance, grievance and, like, again, he's, he plays up to the cameras. He's got a bit of a persona, but I, to be honest, I'd rather have characters and things like that, and that's what you, you do like to see in football. Um, but it's just an exceptionally good finish. That's what he's there to do. I think that there was a lot of... You see some United fans that are sort of leaving comments last week after that game against Cali, and they're like, oh, it doesn't look interesting. Get him out of the club as soon as possible. Be happy if he never played again. And yet, he comes in with a performance like that yesterday, and he does some a turn. Again, I'd agree with Leslie that I think that uh, 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 Keith Watson in there is going to make a big difference in terms of getting up against Louis Moat. It's a flick on and then a shot and that ends up in the back of the net. I actually didn't see the goal itself because of just the way the structure was fan dice, but um, it was, um, vision was just blocked off by other people, but at the same time, like you could see where it was coming and what happened, and it's just really unfortunate that it happened in the first phase. One thing I do want to call out, and it's something that we've all spoken about, and I think it's been widely condemned by the Rovers fans, was the person that chucked a bottle at him. What are you doing, man? Get a grip. Like, seriously. Like, if your reaction is to take a quarter bottle in a football game I'm, and then chuck it at a player, and based on what I've seen on Pine Bovril, apparently the, that person spent the rest of that game spewing and sleeping in the stand. Like, what's the point? Who Who's benefiting from that? If it hits Tony Watt, the club gets a huge fine. Just have a 
if you can't control yourself on the drink, just didn't come to the football. Like, pure and simple, just daft behaviour. Absolutely daft behaviour. Tony Watt was absolutely right to call you out on that um, and to, to sort of point at you. And I don't know why it's not been it's not been taken further action, but just really, really low, low behaviour. Like, nobody needs it. It just brings a bad feeling to a game where everyone, all the build-up before the game was really positive. Sure, there was a bit of back and forth between United fans and Rovers fans in the streets, but nobody's taking that too serious. And then you go and do something like that. What's the point? Absolutely, what is the point? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you know, by all means engage. On you go, John. I was just going to say, by all means engage. I wouldn't go as far as uh, Robbie to say I like Tony Watt, but I can appreciate what he does. He's he's technically a good footballer, but on the other side, he's great at winding up opponent. He winds up um, other supporters. He's the kind of hate figure that that for other teams, but then. He did yesterday. He wiped it. Was it Liam Dick when he wiped him yeah. out at the at the side of the pitch? Now that was one thing. Phil Nicholson, who I travelled to the game with, um, the pair of us were discussing it, and and that was a game where I thought Nick Walsh he had his colour of card out very quickly. You know, he didn't assess the situation. Uh, he just gave a yellow card, and that was it. Because it, it it was a nasty one, but you can see Tony Watt winding up his own players, so he's gene up his own players. So you can appreciate what he does for your team, but I wouldn't go as far as say as I like him, Robbie. See, see for me, John, right? He's their Dylan Easton. That's the equivalent, like in the sense that Dylan yeah. Easton, great at winding up opposition fans, yeah. occasionally comes out with moments of magic that you think. Really could be playing at a higher level. And it was interesting, actually, before the game, hopefully, hopefully we get some news soon about a, a potential Dylan Easton contract renewal, which would be an absolutely huge boost for everyone at the club. Um, so Courier were sort of leading with that. So fingers crossed that comes through. But aye, that's that's sort of my angle on it. And I'd far rather have people like that in football that do go on the wind-up. I don't mind it when you see, sure, I'll sure at the time but you get people like Robbie Muirhead for example or Dom Thomas I would far rather have that than some beige character that just like celebrates and runs yeah. back to the halfway line Keep, make it interesting that's what you want you want a game that's investing you want a game where you've got these sort of like pantomime villains you want and that's what I'm taking from it like and fair enough he enjoyed it we've given them plenty to plenty to be grieved about this season so if he's gained it back fair play to him the thing with Tony Watt is that, like, he knows what he's doing. But it's, it's, and like sometimes it boils over and stuff, and we've seen him be sent off and or get him involved in stuff that he shouldn't. But I remember when they were up at Cali Thistle in a Friday night game, uh, they scored really late on to to win that game, and he was the whole second half right in the face of one of their centre halves, and when they scored, he was right in at him. Actually, I think in the net. Aye. And then at full time, you could see the second the full time whistle goes, he was over and he's apologising to him. And they asked him about it after the game. And he's like, uh, yeah, that's like, because during the game, like, I've basically said, I've got a job to do. And part of that, you know, he didn't go into this much detail, but you can clearly see it where he's like, I think I might get a benefit out of winding this guy up. And it's a little bit like um, Scott Brown's interview at half time on the Friday night game just there between Aaron and Airdrie. And he was saying that when he went to Celtic, he just decided, like, this is a persona I'm going to adopt. And, uh, you know, I'm going to shave my head. And this is also a persona that John and I have adopted as well. But he's like, I'm just going to be the villain and live up to that. And I, and he did the opposite. He's like, I'm just not going to talk to anybody during the game. I just will not converse, will not say a word. But that's to say he knows what he's doing. And I think that's... Like then that is a benefit to his team. And as I say, I think that the only way to do it is to ignore him, really. You've got to just try and not rise to it, because as soon as you give him something to cling on to, and the second you chuck a glass bottle at him, he's certainly got a point to prove. And he's going to want to get it right up here. And you can see that. I think that could quite easily be the best game he's had all season. Um, but yeah, because that's, that's what he's there to do. It's when he, he can't get his head into a game that... Um, is the reason he's playing in the championship. 
Um, Leslie, anything for you just finally on Tony Watt? I mean, I was going to say when you were mentioning the thing about the Inverness game, it was it was the same in the last uh, Dundee United game at Starks. He was the same. He was right up in Big Kev's face. And then there was it looked like they were having a fight at full time, but it turned out, no, it was exactly the same thing. He was going up and apologising. You know, and you know, I said they're weapons grade bay lines. I'm sure they're perfectly decent guys on the pitch. But like Robbie says, we've got guys that are like that too. You know, Dylan Easton is a, is a nutcase on the pitch. Big Kev is a nutcase on the pitch. Ross Millen was as well. You know, we've, we've got these guys and it, it, it makes it fun. By all means, you know, boo the opposition for doing that. Then they throw things at them. They're, they're just human right. beings. Then they throw things at them. You know, get in it, you know, boo them, you know, sing songs as long as you're, you're they're within reason. But then they, they throw things. I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that, like, going to the football is a bit like going to, like, I don't know. You, you go to watch something like a theatre or something like that. It's not like you would get involved yourself. Like, you just go and you watch it and then you disappear home at the end or go to the cinema or something like that. Like, nobody's asking you to get personally involved. Like, this is between them. Like, you're someone that sits on the outside just watching and you get invested and you're like, yeah, this is great. My team's winning. It's classic goodies and baddies. But I just, end of the day, they're all human beings and... It's just when you see stuff like that, you just think, man, it's just so dumb. It is so, so dumb to be doing stuff like that. But folk get drinking them, take it a bit too far. And just to, I think there to, are. Take it exceptionally far when you're chucking bottles at people. There are, there are very clear lines that just, uh, yeah, they, that should not and cannot be crossed. And uh, it just, um, I don't know how easy it would be to, to identify a perpetrator. I suspect the shed at Tannadice is not wired for uh, security cameras, seeing as it's... <clears throat> I don't think, I think it predates the invention of wire, but um, hopefully that, that person can be identified and banned because I've got no interest in, in sharing this stand with them anytime soon. Um, right, listen, we're going to have to talk about the rest of this game. Uh, probably the next kind of notable incident and uh, we've kind of touched upon it already is uh, Louis Moult's booking who's kind of wrestling with uh, you and Murray as the ball comes over Murray's kind of shoved him slightly to the side and as Murray kind of dips down the head it, Louis Moult kicks him right in the face um, as you mentioned Robbie Nick Walsh was the referee for our game at Easter Road where he sent Liam Dick off for a very similar incident. Um, I watched that back this morning just to kind of remind myself of, of exactly what it was like. And actually, it's not as bad as I remember it being. And uh, the Liam Dick one and the Molt one looks slightly worse than I thought it did at the time. But my overriding feeling is still, though, that the Liam Dick one was too harsh. I think they're both yellow cards. I, I don't think Molt should be sent off for that. He's, there's no intent. He's, he's certainly... It's a booking. He's, um, I, 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 can, I can never get the terminology right, but whatever the one for a yellow card is, it's, it's careless, but it's not, you know, endangering or whatever the terminology is. I don't think yeah. it crosses the line for, for me. I think as well it doesn't help that the, the after effects of the Dick one were very, very noticeable, whereas with our one it was, I mean, obviously Murray gets up, plays on for a little bit and then has to come off, but uh, it's just, uh, it's just, it is frustrating, and football fans were always going to find these inconsistencies, but you've just got to accept that it's part and parcel of the game, don't you? That's it. And I, and I see, I'm, I'm, yesterday's I'm not overly bothered by. I'm, I'm still quite annoyed about the one at Easter Road, but I'm not overly bothered by yesterday's. Um, after that, you've then got kind of the remainder of the first half, which is kind of half chances for, for Dundee United. Um, I caught a little bit of... Rory Loy on the radio just I was getting back in the car and he was saying that um, and he said a couple of things that, that were, were absolutely fair but he said uh, Dunn United had a, a lot of chances to go and make it more I was like man I don't really remember there were an awful lot of chances and, and looking at the highlights I think um, Kev makes two saves in that first half and um, following him kind of rifles one over the bar that he should probably get on target but um, certainly, I mean, the Rovers did very, very little kind of getting out. Um, John, any any kind of thoughts from you on, on that first half and whether there was, when you hoping for or expecting anything, any kind of change from the Rovers? Well, 
I know it's, I heard the Rory Loy thing as well, and I, I was quite surprised about what he said. But even in his match report, he didn't he mention the Zach Grudden shot that came off the bar. You know, that, that didn't even get a mention. Um, I think the only time I heard it get mentioned was when you mentioned it in your piece on the, on the radio as well. Um, and that was kind of, that was really the only kind of, it wasn't really a chance. It was something that Zach Grudden made for himself and uh, created and, and shot. And that was the only real half chance we had. Now. Other than that, I don't remember us working their goalie at all. Other than the first three, four minutes, and it was it was quite disappointing. But I never felt Dundee United were going to add to their score either. So I was actually quite happy. It won nothing down going in at half time. I thought, right, that's that's we're there. We've we've kind of weathered a bit of a storm. Um, and we should be all right now if we could come out and 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 do better in the second half. Well, it was quite interesting getting into half time because you do ask the question whether Ian Murray is going to pull the trigger and make changes at the point. That point, I was certainly saying because Kev Barretto he was in front of me and certainly saying to him we were having that discussion and there was a bit of chat in the group chat about it as well. Like if you are Ian Murray, do you get in at that point and say, hey, right, this isn't really working? Do we need to make some changes at half time? Potentially bring on Jack Campbell in, and then make that change in the midfield because of how little change that we were getting out of it. Um. So yeah, it was it was quite interesting. But at one note, you still felt we were very much in the game. We went. <laughs> I mean, by no means we only had one shot on target all day, so we obviously weren't at the races. But at the same time, like you did feel like if we could get a half chance and. That Rudden opportunity was a perfect example of that. You can get a ball outside the box and then you take a shot and the next thing you know it's cannon off the crossbar. Anything like that can happen. And that completely changes the dynamic of the game if it goes in, of course. So, uh, just um, it was a question of when we were going to make the change and how, how we would do it. And I think even Murray did actually make it in decent time. He didn't wait too long after half time to actually do it. I think it was about maybe the... 55th, 60th minute or so that he, he brought the, the double sub of Smith and Hamilton on? I think so, yeah. And that, I mean, it's actually, I, I'd completely forgotten about the concussion sub rule. Yeah. Um, so once we had to make that substitution in the first half, I was a little bit like, oh, we're not going to get another change, you, you, you know, because um, you, you only get so many stoppages and all this kind of stuff. And it, it's not in, in Ian Murray's nature, really, to make kind of quick changes. And even at half time, um, I didn't really have any expectation that he would make a change. I kind of hoped he would, but I didn't think he would. But actually, I agree with both of you. Getting in at half time at 1 0, I felt like there is actually a chance here. Um, because the big thing with Dundee United, and I've said this since quite early on in the season, it, when you keep them sort of within arm's reach, that's when they can be got at. The second they can get it to 2-0, they'll run away with it. Because they've got the quality to keep it tight at the back with that kind of easing of, of expectation or, or easing of pressure. Um, and they've absolutely got the quality up front. I mean, these these stats are a little bit out of date. This was the 4th of March, and I don't know if um, other than yesterday it's happened since. But um, is their final results, having gone 2-0 up this season, this is from the uh, Wraith Over Stats Twitter account. I didn't do this work myself. Uh, so it's at Stats Wraith, doing some good work. But uh, Dundee United, having gone 2-0 up in the league this season, their games have finished 4-0, 3-0, 2-0, 5-0, 6-0, 2-0, 3-0, and then yesterday, 2-0 again. Uh, just by comparison, the Rovers results, having gone 2-0 uh, up, are 3-2, 2-1, 2-1, 4-3, 2-2, and 2-3, when we get beat at our growth. So it's just, you know, they go 2-0 up and they can stretch their legs. And I think getting in and 1-0 at half time. You think, no, there is a chance here. We, we've had, um, you know, that Rudden chance was a nice reminder that 
anything could happen. You could get a goal out of out of nowhere. But unfortunately, start the second half, we just didn't really, didn't really. We had a slightly better period. Um, John, as you say, I was I was briefly on uh, Radio Scotland last night at the same time as they played Ian Murray's interview, and he said that um, in the second half he thought the Rovers were on top, and um, I, I, I didn't agree with that then, and I don't agree with it now. I think we were better than we had been in the first half for a spell in that second half. But there's no way we were better than Dundee United. The, the goalkeeper was, can was a spectator. Much pinpoint it from minute to minute. I think from the 55th minute to the 75th minute, which was when Jack Hamilton and Smith come on, yeah, uh, up to the penalty. I think that you started seeing... So the balls, like Hamilton was winning more in the air. And Smith just had a, a sort of, you could tell Smith was like, right, just get running in behind. And it did work. It did work to a degree. Miller, Thompson, Smith looked quite composed, uh, going head to head against Thompson. Thompson looked quite uncomfortable when Smith was sort of sizing them up. And you thought, oh, there might be might be a bit of an opportunity for us to get something here. Um, United gradually, probably bit by bit, got more and more sort of comfortable against them. And then Again, you get to the penalty and that just completely kills the game stone dead. Yes, I think as, as soon as it goes to 2 0, I'd say that was, I mean, I was the chucking in the towel, but I really just thought that's, you know, um, <clears throat> it's real. Uh, this is the one thing we didn't want to happen, but twice. Didn't want them <laughs> to score early. And then, yeah, when you're fight back, you're always running the risk. But as soon as it goes to 2 0, I just did not see a kind of path back into that game for us. See before um, we so just get to the, the before we get to the penalty, did I miss something? Was Vaughn taking off? Was that a precaution or was it purely tactical? Ta- I thought it was tactical. I guess it was tactical as well. I, I just don't think he was particularly involved. Nah. Yeah, I mean, I was I was just wondering because he's one of these players, a bit like Dylan Easton. Even if he's not having a great game, he's got that quality, and he only needs a moment to do something magical. But yeah, if if, if that was a, a tactical thing, then. Maybe I don't know whether I would... think Lewis Vaughn's not foil for a playing off a target man, and I don't think Zach Ruddon's a target man as such, anyway. Mm. Um, so I think that both of them are far better when we get the ball in the feet, but it just wasn't happening yesterday. Um, that's, and that's, I think you're absolutely spot on. I think that the that everybody's jobs yesterday were all based around a game that did not take place, <laughs> and that is I see that's with the benefit of hindsight, you never know what would have could have happened going into a game, but. We were set up to keep the ball and play passes into feet. And we maybe did it four times across 90 minutes. It just was never there. And yeah, we did it really well in the first five minutes and it looked really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then that's, I see, there's, there's logic in it. It's not like outright, you know, it's not outrageous. But I think the biggest thing for me is after 15 minutes, you know, once we were a goal down, we then played another 10 minutes where they were getting these chances. I think at that point is when it was it was time to kind of make a change of, of some description um, to try and counteract that. And uh, yeah, as you say, once, once Jack Hamilton comes on, he starts getting more change out of the defence. Um, but by that stage, their defence had time to settle into the game. They, they kind of knew what their job was. I mean, that's one thing when, when Jack Hamilton comes on in the second half. There's no surprises. There's no like, oh God, how are they going to use him? You know what your job is. And uh, Ross Graham and Sam McClelland were always set up to, to win headers. It was going to be tough. And he did well, on, but we never managed to really create much off the back of it. And then the penalty really, um, I'd say more or less ends the game uh, as a contest, uh, to be kind of brutally honest. It's not a penalty, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's a dive from Louis Moult. But what I will say is I also think it's it's poor defending. I think it's naive defending from Keith Watson. And I don't think you can be too critical. Um uh too too, too much criticism being aimed at Nick Walsh. I think you can see I can see exactly why he's given it. Yeah. As it's as it as the move kind of starts, you know, Malt makes his run and, and kind of gets himself really tight to Keith Watson, you know, gives him that just that little shove. Um, but there's body as much as anything it's not a foul um, 
And as he gets tight, the big kind of cardinal sin that Keith Watson commits is he puts his arms around Louis Moult. And as soon as he does that, Moult's like, yeah, beauty. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I was looking for. Aye. And you can see, because it's as the move, as you can almost see it in the highlights, as Nick Walsh turns to look into the box, because he's been watching the ball, the first thing he sees is that Keith Watson's got his arms around Louis Malt and Louis Malt's arms are in the air, and he goes down. And so, as you, when you see the whole thing, and you can watch it from start to finish, you can see it's a dive. There's not enough contact to, to put him down, but and you can also see exactly why the referee's given it. Um, yeah, he's, he's getting a one-off view of it, and I think it's intelligent play from Malt. Penalties are penalties it's in the sense that like some of them are more on the dubious side, um, but we've been the beneficiary of those as well. So you've always got to take them with a bit of pinch of salt, and it's frustrating. But at the end of the day, it wasn't a deciding factor in the game. It killed the game absolutely, yeah. but it wasn't. Dundee United were the better team over the piece, um, and I don't didn't hear any Rovers fans sort of saying, "Oh, we were robbed there." Nobody's going to be coming on here today with sour grapes. I think there's yeah. a bit of frustration on our own part that we didn't. Maybe put into the put in a performance that we'd hoped, but at the same time you can understand, given the the sort of the sort of news coming into the game and the feeling that they were under a bit of pressure. That was definitely sort of the the sort of vibe as such that you had beforehand. But at the same time, look, they'd done their job really well, and I think you've got to give them credit because it was a huge game. And I don't think at the end there was an over celebration on their part. You sometimes see that, and I don't. Th- I think that from the Rovers fans as well, um, there was a few voices of dissent, shall we say? But over the piece, the majority of the fans stayed there till the end, clapped them off the pitch. We're still singing at the end as well. I don't think anyone thinks the title race is over. I'm sure some of their fans do, um, but at the same time, we've still got five games left. The worst we can do is just to go in to those five games with a strong run of form. And if we do end up in the playoffs, which it might not be the case, it might be that there are twists and turns in this sort of these final five games, that we go into these playoffs in a good run of form. So it's all about just keeping the head. And I think that the, the supporters did that yesterday. I thought that I was really proud of the Rover support just as, as fellow supporters, just because nobody was going over the top in terms of the reactions, the majority of people were supportive at the end, they were there for uh, the players, and that's what you want to see, you don't want to see people sort of screaming, I know that it was mentioned about the Queen's Park game where people were telling them that they were an embarrassment and stuff like that, that didn't happen yesterday, um, that didn't happen at all, so fair play you see the crowd and it was 10,300, that should have been 11,000 as well, but again, we're, we've spoken about that at great length before um, and I think it was a, I know everyone's going to say it's a cliche, but it's a good advert for championship football to see 11,000 people going to, well, 10,300 people going to a game and us taking up that level of support. And all we can do is carry on with what we've done. Um, And I know that we've rustled the jimmies of a lot of clubs this season, but it's important to have our own take on it. And that take should be very much that we've made so much progress. This time last year, we just came off the back of a, or we were just about to get beaten by Hamilton to effectively end our season. And now here we are with five games left that were four points behind with a game in hand. We've and actually got six games left. Six. Ooh. Do we? Aye, six games. Yeah. And um, thank you there, John. I can't keep track of the basic stats. Um, but yeah, just all we can do is keep the heat and just see what happens. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, John, any... Any thoughts from you on the, the, the penalty, and to be honest, really just right up to the to the end of the game and, and anything on the, the run-in as well? No, I just, um, I've, I've said what I thought on the penalty earlier, that, that it shouldn't have been a penalty. Um, I, um, I, 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 I just agree with Robbie. You know, we've still got six games to go and six games where... Um, they've got two difficult games coming up. Dundee United are away to Queen's Park and then to Greenock. Um, I don't expect them to have um, an easy time in these games. We've got three games on the bounce. They'll not be um, at home. They'll not be easy for us either. But if we win three games in a week at home, we're back. The least we are, we're back to a point behind them. 
and it's uh, and we go again, and it's it's all to play for. We we've all agreed there'll be twists and turns before the end of the season. Yesterday was a bit of disappointment for everybody, but I'm sure the players will just dust themselves down and and we'll go again. Yeah, the um, there was a Dundee United fan on kind of immediately after me on Sports Hound last night, and he'd said, I, th- I think I'm right in saying this, that they've only won more than two games on the bounce once this season, and that was they won three in a row. Um, so, and, and listen, right, they, they've got five games left. See, if they do go and win all five games, then absolutely fair play and deservedly champions. Like, that would be the stuff of champions, but it would be unprecedented. They've not done that so far this season, and as you say, John, the next fortnight is going to be really key. So I think almost this kind of run-in or this title race or whatever it is, it kind of happening in in phases. And the last little phase has always was always going to be defined by this game at Tanadins. And yeah. they've won that and they, they get that sort of, you know, they, they win that battle and they get the, the spoils for that. But we then move into this next phase, which is basically the next fortnight. Because by the time you get to the evening of April the 14th, the Rovers have played three games all at home. Dundee United have played two games away from home. So that's really, I mean, that's really a a defining period. And I mean, I'm certainly not going to sit here now and make any predictions about what's going to happen. I mean, really, there there could be about a 12-point swing you know, either way, in realistic scenarios of, of what the table looks like by the night of the 14th. So it's, and I mean, we said it before, that this game was never going to define anything. It's a huge factor. And, uh, you know, Ian Murray said it, and you'd be much happier had we won yesterday. But at the same time, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have finished anything. It, it's not um the, the Scottish Championship most. roulette wheel is merely slowing down. It's not landed on tangerine <laughs> or blue yet, shall we say? <laughs> exactly. That's it. And it's, um, it's just. I mean, well, it's easy to say it now, um, and it maybe does sound a little bit trite, but like it is just another game. It is now that it's done and it's happened. It's just another game that put points on the board. So all you can do is just forget about it and go to the next one. 100%. And um, I suspect that's what Dundee United will be doing as well. It's just like, you know, forget about it, move on. You know, I don't think there's been any kind of silliness after full time. I think they have done what you would almost want your own team uh, to do. I did see a wee of bit of silliness. Them. Did see a wee bit of silliness heading down Dens Road. Like, there was a, a few... Oh, no, I meant from like from the club itself. From oh, Jim yeah, Berlin. yeah, from the club so itself. I, I mean, fans I, are I, I, funny I like that. Sp- Expected Jim, Jim Goodwin to be kind of out and kind of giving it big licks. And listen, I would have taken that, uh, probably. But I don't think they have. I think they've been very kind of keeping their powder dry and just sensible about it. And and that's you know kind of probably a good thing, to be honest. Um, they, you know, all things being equal, they should win the league. They should really want the fewest possible external factors and external things to happen so um, but it, is, it will be interesting I think this next fortnight I think really well. takes you down to a final kind of three game shootout and um, it, but there's no easy fixtures anyway so it, it just will to be say as well course. they're going to be going into those games as well with a defence that's only came together in this last sort of picture so like this last match so again you don't know how long Gallagher's going to be out for hope by all accounts, sounds like it was a pretty nasty one, and and um, I hope he's back soon. Ideally, albeit not to, not too quickly, just to to come back and give yeah, them enough defensive the solidity. After the season's finished. We'll aye, be aye. Ideally, he steps off his flight in IB fine. and he's magically absolutely fine. That would suit me perfectly because I've got no issues with the guy. But um, football and wise, I hope that it's not impacting us. Um, but yeah, just um, overall though, it's it's something that could potentially be a factor for them. But I it's just it's coming to that point in the season where you're seeing the run in. And I think that we the only thing we can do is focus on the games that we've got. And Air gave us a torrid time at Starks Park the last time where it took a ninetieth minute goal to to win it. Um or to, to get an equaliser for us. 
you can't take that game for granted. So we're going to have to focus on that one firstly. So, see, I was thinking Absolutely. what I was thinking was, you know, if we get to the end of the season and we fall short, we're not going to look back at that game at Tannadice as being the game that decided it. You know, we're no. not we're not going to get to the end of the season and think, oh, if we'd won that one, that would have decided it for us. I mean, I was thinking as well, we don't in recent history have a great record in end of season top of the table clashes. Um, we had the uh, the game at, when Ayr came to Starks and thought they'd won the league, and but we all know how that turned out. We then had uh, the Dunfermline game where Martin Hardy scored while I was giving the speech at my wedding. We then had what the Arbroath fans like to call Colin Hamilton Day, but this you know this is this is a bit different. It's not right at the end of the season. It's not like a kind of do or die game. There's a lot to come yet, and you know. If we do fall short, as I say, this is not going to be one of the games that we look back on and say, that's where it swung, that's what cost us. You know, there's, there's various other points in the season. There's a lot, a lot to come yet. Thanks for running through those, Leslie. That's really cheered me up. Happy Easter. <laughs> um, right, any any final thoughts? Anything anybody wants to add? Are we quite, uh, quite happy to just put a cap on that and never speak of it again? As well, I'll say... I, on you go, John. I was just going to say, you know, it'd be great if we hear that, that Kevin Holt's available for Dundee United in their playoff games. That was his name. <laughs> Ever yes. the optimist, John. Ever the I optimist. Think that, I think we'll take that as our, uh, as our note to end on. So thank you, um, everybody, for uh, for watching and listening and, and reliving that little bit of misery with us. Um, we will be back later on in the week because uh, we'll look forward to that visit of Air United, which, uh, as they all are at this point in the season, another big critical game. Um, and hopefully, we'll uh, we'll have a, a slightly more uh, a slightly more positive um, approach to the podcast. Uh, we'll, we'll put our optimistic hats back on, um, presumably, kind of Thursday night as we uh, we get together for that one. So, as I say, thank you very much for listening and for watching if you chose to do so. And we will see you again soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.